Hey friends, waiting for my friend Sasha to join us here so that we can hang out talking about grief and community and vulnerability and she should be here in just a second and fingers crossed just as we did last time everybody has to believe that we can do this uh, so that I can get her invited on here really quickly. All right, I love to see everybody just sort of rolling in. It's pretty cool to, to know that we can connect together in real time like this, given especially that we have people from all over the world. Um, hi, everybody. As soon as Sasha jumps on here, there. Oh, I see coming. There we go. View. I think we did it. Let's see. Dun, dun, dun. This was so much smoother. I shouldn't say this until we actually get Sasha on here. See, look, we did it. Hey, that uh, was, now that was seamless. That was seamless. I'm that really seamless. quite proud of us. I'm yeah. really proud of both of us because yeah. I felt like we were both not entirely sure that this would happen this way. <laughs> and we like, we did, we did, we set ourselves up for success. We, we like, did, exactly. All, all, and you yeah. know, what we should have coordinated though was lipstick colors. I should have known you would have shown up with the like strong lip and I should have <laughs> I felt like, honestly, this was the highlight. This was the highlight of putting this lipstick on today. And it feels, makes me feel normal. So I Excellent. had to do it. Well, I'm glad. You I'm know? glad. I had, a, I had a really, really early morning TV interview this morning um, because they were on the East Coast and I'm on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I had it in my head like, eh, this is no big deal. Like, I can just, yeah. you know, throw it together. And then I realized it was like a major media outlet. And oh, I was like, oh. I should have worn makeup. I should have put <laughs> lipstick on. In anyway. fairness, no one's really wearing makeup right now. So I think you were, you're probably absolutely right? That was, no. see, that was what I was thinking. I was thinking yeah. like, everything is chill right now. Yeah. No, not when it's a major network. <laughs> no, those folks are, I don't know uh, what they're doing to still look <laughs> anyway. So this, everybody is like a little behind the scenes in, in yeah. the world of interviews uh, thing that you don't often hear about how sometimes calls for media are very early in the morning and you make decisions and about very, lipstick uh, and can be threat can be stressful ahead. it can be stressful you know sorry i'm just gonna right? close the door you know i mean actually you're, you're, this brings we're being silly about this but this actually brings up a really uh interesting point that i obsess about like i know i'm a perfectionist and i like things to be very specific yeah. but it's because i want people to pay attention to the work and i want people to pay attention to the message i don't want them distracted by like errant bra strap or um, me being yeah. slightly less coherent than usual um, because it's four in the morning for me and I haven't had tea. <laughs> and and it's that, like we can think that these things are really beneficial, but the work is important. No, no, right? no, like, the I message totally that get it. You yeah. Find both, the, the, yeah, like the, the message is what's important, but the way that that message gets delivered is also important because if it's not delivered um, in a good package, then the message doesn't get heard. So. Um, I think that's a really good segue to introducing folks to you and to the Grief Encounters yeah. podcast in case they haven't met you Hi, before. everybody. Do you want to say just a couple of words about the podcast and your awesomeness? And yeah, so um, how we have a podcast, um, which you, Megan, has been a guest on, um, which was a real highlight for us. Um, it's a podcast. We're based in Ireland, but I think we're kind of not Irish centric in the sense that we have guests from all over the world. Um, and I, I guess I think it's really just about stories. It's people telling the stories of the people that they loved, how they lost them, and then how they are living their lives since that happened. And, you know, we don't, we're, we don't have qualifications. We're not people who have studied grief, but we've both myself, her, uh, my co-host is Venetia. Um, we've both experienced it in our lives and it changed our lives. And um, so we both felt really passionate when we met each other um, about looking at these stories and telling these stories. And we both worked in the media. We both do work in the media and we have for a long time. So telling stories came really naturally. Um, and I think we've been, to say privileged would be an understatement in getting to hear these most intimate most beautiful, most cherished stories from people. Um, mm -hmm. And we've been so lucky every time, every time someone sits down in the room, every single time, it feels remarkably special that they would be willing to open up yeah. and talk with us. 
Um, so it's been probably one of the greatest things I've ever done. <laughs> uh, one of the most surprising things it came, you know, I, I didn't anticipate that this would ever be a part of my story or my life, but, um, to say that it's taught us, I think Venetia would agree with me, taught us so much about, um, people and empathy and, you know, I, I found, how I found your work um, was after both my parents had died, I kind of was like searching for anyone that would understand the position I was in. And I thankfully landed on some of your work, which so maybe that was the initial seed of our podcast. Who knows? <laughs> I like to be, you know, the Johnny Appleseed. Of <laughs> there you I go. Like sure. Yeah. One yeah. of my favorite things about your podcast is that uh, the story focus there, I mean, there's so many different ways to do a podcast and to talk about grief. But what I love about your podcast with Venetia is, is your, just exactly how you described it, like, how people the story of how people are living with this loss that changed mm -hmm. them. And that's a different angle than I think a lot of podcasts come at it. And, and uh, there is something really special about listening to people's stories. Like we, we yeah. do that a lot in your grief course, right? Like that community is, is where people come together and tell their own story about what it's like to be them. And that is so mm -hmm. powerful. And we see that in our, in our comments uh, here on Instagram lives and of course, like on the social media channels, but being privileged to, to witness and to hear people's real stories of their lives like that, that is powerful. It's really powerful. And it teaches you, I think, you know, you talk a lot about this and you do it better than I do it in terms of articulation, but I think there's a lot of, um, sometimes people kind of, there's a lot of blankets and grief, like this is how it is, or this is how people should be, or this is how people react. And by sitting and hearing these stories, it became so clear that it was so different for so many people. There were mm -hmm. threads of truth. There were threads that connected us, but they had so many different ways that it changed them or that they coped. And that was such a beautiful eye opener for me as a person. I felt like mm -hmm. I evolved immediately when I started to realize that my grief experience wasn't the exact same as someone else's um, and yeah. learning that and then kind of like being really struck by it and thinking it was, <laughs> there were similarities, but there were also these incredible differences. And I don't know, I just thought that there was just so much, um, richness in learning about how people I, I guess just hearing their stories and knowing um how it shaped their lives mm -hmm. so how do you think how do you think having that having your view expanded that way like how did that change the way that you see the world the way that you see your own grief um and the way that you kind of see community how did that really every change for you? <laughs> look in how did every it not fit for you? Can we yeah, say I mean, there? I don't know. How does, that's probably like the best thing to say is like, how does it not change? Like it for me, it everything changed, everything. Um, and I think the best thing it did it has done for me personally, and I won't speak for anybody else, but for me personally, um, my curiosity and my openness is completely. I'm, I feel like a much more open. Mm -hmm much more That's, curious person. I love that, that it kind of sparked your curiosity. Yeah. So um, we had Lennon Flowers on last time, earlier this week, and she yeah. was talking about leading with curiosity. And somebody actually put in the comments, I don't know if, if you're here this time, friend, but somebody put in the comments that their, uh, that their dissertation topic is uh, the neuroscience of curiosity, which oh, wow. doesn't that yeah. sound like the most fascinating thing ever. But I, I love that. that hearing other people's stories awakens your own curiosity like mm. humans are fascinating and when we when we start to um allow that other people's experience one can be different from ours but two is valid right then we get yeah. to be like oh isn't that interesting that you have that your loss affected you this way it doesn't happen like that for me like that's so interesting instead mm. of like no 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 my way is the right way Exactly. Yeah. And I think le like, le like one of the things I learned from you shared a video that's been shared by quite a number of people <laughs> um, talking a little bit about how to maybe um, sit with someone when they're not when they're not when they're not at their finest moment in their life and they're having a difficult time, whether yeah. that be grief, I think it applies to a lot of things. But 
you shared that video and what I um, what I loved about it was the thing I've learned from it in the curiosity side of things is challenging myself when I'm involved mm. when I'm with someone and I don't understand their experience so that curious letting that curiosity lead and putting kind of the closed the closed fearful side of me aside and saying try and remain open try not to be afraid of something you don't understand um yeah. and like I'll be completely honest sitting with some of our guests who have had the most unimaginable circumstances mm -hmm. I, I feel scared. My heart races before I sit down because I'm so scared of sitting with that pain and, and trying to honor it, but also just trying to be open and not fearful because these people, it's almost like they're like sacred, like they've gone through yeah. something that, you know, right. you can't, so you have to, So, but I think by remaining open and challenging that curiosity and being able to sort of learn more about yourself and the world which you know is what it's done for me obviously you know and I you always you always drive this home really well which is like not sugarcoating this I'm not trying to make this seem like some sort of silver lining thing it's just when I'm looking at the experience for me the curiosity is just one thing that's evolved well it sounds like it gives you a a layer of comfort in like the when you're facing this like daunting um, enormity, right? Like sitting with somebody who has had such a massive loss, mm -hmm. um, it is daunting, right? I keep thinking mm -hmm. of a terrible beauty. Is that Yates? My yeah, literature yeah, yeah, skills yeah, yeah. are, are very not very good. on point today, but I'm no. sure it's terrible. Yeah. Thank you. It I'm is. The brain library sometimes. <laughs> um, but that, that concept of terrible beauty, right? That um sitting sitting in the shadow of somebody's immense trauma or loss like that is very daunting for all mm. of those reasons that you brought up and also like i don't want to fuck this up yeah. like please help me not say something stupid and unintentionally mm. insensitive like all of those things but also just the force of it right like mm. it is a force um, yeah. and i i feel like curiosity can sort of help um, uh, soothe that, soothe that dauntedness, I guess, a little bit. Yeah. Like, or at least, like, or at least, like, let us enter the room and turn on the microphone, right? Like, exactly. I, I, exactly. It sounds like that. That's like curiosity lets you turn on the microphone when you're when you're feeling like mm, can't. It it does, and it goes back to the thing that is so. I mean, I know has been so important to me, which is the like say their name type of yes. thing, right? So like. It goes back to allowing someone, because I know I need it. I need it when I love when people ask me about my parents. It makes me feel much better. And I know that a lot of people don't, don't you know, if they haven't experienced grief, sometimes that's a real weird one for them. They're like, yeah. surely you must not want to talk about it. Um, but when you're sitting with someone and, right. and you, you don't want to remind you that your person is dead. <laughs> yeah, I forgot. It's weird. That's I don't know how I, I forgot about that. <laughs> exactly yeah. but when when you allow the curiosity allows you to find out more about the person I find that like you know like these people then who they start to come to life and you can see them you can he like imagine what they were like and I find that really wonderful it's like yeah. you know trying to um they almost I mean I'm not getting hippie crazy hippie on this because uh you know but it's like they kind of come into the room a little bit and it's really nice you know it's like yeah, a really well, we nice have, thing we about this when, uh, I mentioned that the other day when we were talking about saying the person's name and asking about them mm -hmm. and sharing about them it makes them three-dimensional they do enter the room right I feel like yeah. you know especially in the first several years after Matt died like well honestly I still do it now I have conversations with him all the time. Yeah. He's pretty quiet. Um, but <laughs> when somebody else joins a conversation, it's like yeah. they become three dimensional. And, and this is why it's so important to say somebody's name or ask them, you know, ask somebody like, so tell me about them. Like, yeah. what was the weirdest thing? Like, what was the weirdest thing your mom used to do on your birthday for you? Like, yeah. just like bring the people into the yeah. room and, and for so many grieving people it's like those invisible losses pile up when people stop asking and stop talking about them right it's like 
suddenly they what they no longer exist yes they do or it erases like it erases the history if you don't if you don't bring their names into the present it erases the history and i think that i agree with you completely the erasing of the history from i it hurts i think it, it actively hurts yeah it's not it's not a passive pain it's kind of like you can actually if you know someone is actively avoiding the subject or just doesn't if i i feel pain or i think you know let's not pretend that they never were here right we just don't have to make, we, just make you comfy <laughs> yeah like we we can we don't always have to talk about it. it doesn't have to be the thing we talk about 24 hours a day but you know yeah. like it's I don't know like I think it's just even hearing you say Matt's name and I love how you talk about the way you talk about him because it makes someone else I think it gives people permission as well to go I can say my person's name now yes. you know and that feels I think that feels like a pretty great thing to give someone when they get the you know and grieving people who when they're talking to each other that's the thing that happens sometimes where they go oh my god I'm allowed to I'm allowed to I'm allowed to talk about it here yeah. yeah, and I think like that's what's so powerful about sh about stories, right? Like about mm -hmm. like a podcast like yours that shares stories and places where we encourage people telling stories because it it gives permission for other people to do that because in so much of like the normal everyday world, people are freaked out by the stories. Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk about your person because it makes them feel weird or helpless. Yeah. Um, so you know that that role modeling, right? Like that, I'll go first. <laughs> Yeah. Whenever, whenever there's something like sort of weird or dodgy about uh, something about grief that I feel like people would probably want to talk about that they're embarrassed about, I'm always going to go first, right? Oh, like, I don't care. Um, but going first, that it opens that door and lets people say, hey, me too, and maybe I can talk about this. And yeah. um, it's one of the things that I really love about the community of grieving people is that um, we really love to listen to each other for the most mm -hmm. part. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think so through reading your work and reading, like, I think one of the most powerful things I've learned, and I know this is going to sound like super basic 101 stuff, but it was a challenge for me. And I'm saying this because it might be a challenge for other people who are watching. Um, I always related my own experience when I was talking to somebody else. I always did that thing, the thing. I always was like, well, when it happened to me, Oh, or, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I was right. like, I was really bad for that. And it was this instinct to like try and tell the person that they were in a safe space. And by the way, I, I, I've been there. So I know what I know. What, I understand. Um, and I've, it's taken me like a lot of, it's still, I still work on it now to try to fight that instinct to just hear right. that story and not bounce it back to mine. Yeah. Um, and that's part of the, I guess, evolution stuff is learning new ways to hear people. And that kind of like, it, it goes far beyond grief. It goes up, it goes to, to everything, everything. Um, to just being able to, if someone's had, you know, lost their job, you, the first thing you don't say is, well, when I lost my job. Right. Hey, when that happened <laughs> to my neighbor's cousin's sister-in-law. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But there's this human instinct, and, and and I actually feel a lot of compassion when I hear someone else do it, or when they do it to me, mm -hmm. because I know that it's coming from a place of just immediately trying to like react without yeah, taking it, that. It's the human impulse to connect, yeah. right? It's the human impulse to connect, and it's it's not really our fault that we do it so badly because that's what we've been trained to do. That right, like yeah. connect, connect, like show them that you empathize, like don't otherize them, like. I All know. of these conflicting messages about how we're supposed to be here for each other. And I, I, I love that you said, like, you know, like, you cringe when you do it. I do it, maybe mm. not a lot, but, like, when I hear myself do it, I'm like, oh, my God, you are supposed <laughs> to be good at this. So I, one of the things that's happening with the pandemic is I'm actually meeting a lot more of my neighbors. Because yeah, I, I am at work, so yeah. like, I, I work from home all the time. Um, but, you know, my neighbors are all working from home. Uh, and I, I met a really lovely neighbor the other day, a um, little sidebar, I was outside and I heard screaming and I thought it was a oh domestic God. violence incident. I thought it was a domestic violence incident. Mm -hmm. So I called it in because obviously I'm gonna take care of who I need to take care of. Uh, but it turned out she was trying to break up a dog fight. Oh God. And she had gotten bitten and that was the screaming. So like, 
yeah. whatever. I, I called it in. Yeah. Uh, I've been that person. I've been that person in danger and needing help and nobody called. So I always, yeah. and fine, it turned out to be a, a not domestic violence. Yay. But anyway, yeah. I met my Still, neighbor. someone needed help. Yeah. <laughs> right. I yeah. met my neighbor because of that. And she was telling me the story about being bitten by her dog. And I swear, like, I watched the thought process go through my head of like, oh, right, that happened like 20 years ago. Because she was talking about like, I feel so bad. I was really pissed off at my dog, but it's also my fault. I didn't set her up for success. And I, I actually did it. I told, I was like, that sounds really hard. Like, I, I, I get that. When I was teaching, blah, blah. And I went through my whole damn story about being <laughs> bitten by a little kid. And three quarters of the way, like, I was already invested in the story. You were there. No were stopping there. me. But the other part of my brain is going, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> don't you but think I, about this? Like, don't you, <laughs> don't you point this out to But is that? Reason? Like, isn't it so good that it's still active for you? Like, you. Yeah. Like, I'm, 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 I mean, it makes me better to hear that. It's like, yeah, it's yeah. got to be, it's got to be active. And maybe that's the whole point is that sure. you have to, like, constantly learn about yourself and find out when you're doing it. Yeah. Um, and, like, you weren't trying to shut, you weren't trying to shut the conversation no, down. I wasn't. I was trying to relate and connect, yeah. right? And so, and this is what we get a lot from, uh, in grief right when you're talking mm -hmm. when you're talking about your experience and somebody is like oh yeah me too so there's i mean let's unpack that for a second because there's a bunch in there one is that impulse to connect and mm -hmm. we think that that's how we empathize and that's how we connect with somebody else and and again it's like it's not our fault that we do that that is the way that we've been trained it's also an instinct mm -hmm. and you can't it's not like you become aware of it and then you're perfect at it forever i literally yeah. talk about this stuff and <laughs> i screw it up and this mm. is this is why we talk about uh, this stuff as practice, right? Like meditation is a practice, compassion is mm. a practice, uh, communication skills need practice, and because we hear pain all the time, everywhere, um, we have a million chances to practice listening. I, yeah, and I, in, right. I I love that you're yeah. saying it like it's not like a finish line. It's not. Like it's you not. Just it can be. Yeah, that you just end up like this super compassionate person who has no um, learning left to do. Yeah. I think I'm that's... a super compassionate person and I'm human and I get tired yeah. and I screw it up sometimes. And I think that has to be okay, right? Yeah. I mean, a, a more skillful response that I could have done in that moment was when I realized what I was doing, <laughs> I could have stopped and said, you know what? I, I just realized that I'm totally taking over your story right now and I'm going to stop my story. Mm -hmm. um, and I've done that before when I've caught myself and been like, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm... I need a do-over. Can we yeah. go back to you? Um, so it's okay to do that. And it's a work in progress, right? And I think so. I think I find that... when I'm when I'm like writing a message now to someone, mm -hmm. I find myself doing the like, write, erase, write, erase, uh, write, right. erase, write, erase. And then I kind of like... Eternal text editor. Yeah, uh, just kind of, but like trying to... Whereas before, I think like I would have been comfortable maybe with a bit of a like traditional response mm -hmm. now i'm like this is important yeah. that this person who's experiencing a loss or has experienced something feels completely heard and not and so if i feel but it's a weird thing it's a weird thing where i'm like you know i'll be like i'll write it and then i'll be like nope you put, you nope. put yourself with mm -hmm. get, nope <laughs> try it again. That from that angle and that is not good <laughs> Try it again. This could know? possibly be interpreted <laughs> in this way, and that is also not good, right? I mean, so I think that there can also be some analysis paralysis in there. Probably, that, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, but I, like that—that that also sort of brings us into a, a lot of the times. It's you know when somebody says, "Hey, when that happened to me." It's more about, uh, I never got to tell my story. So since you brought up grief, I'm going to talk about my story yeah. now. And this is like that, that is irritating as fuck, right? Mm. Like when you said, when you, when you're talking about, you know, my sister was killed by a drunk driver in a crosswalk mm. and you say, that reminds me of when my, my sister, mm -hmm. um, went through this terrible divorce and like, whoa, that's yeah. hijacking, right? Like that's hijacking, um, somebody's story with, a story that you've been wanting to tell but haven't had a space to do it. And I think this is why we do that to each other so often yeah. is because we don't have spaces to tell the story. And that doesn't mean the story goes
goes away, it means it sort of waits in the wings, waiting for its on, like waiting for its cue. Like, oh my God, now it's my turn. Um, which is why it's so important that we make these spaces um, like the ones that you've created to be able to tell stories because it's so important. And that's, I mean, I guess, I guess what we hope is that because podcasting is like a really in intimate genre or medium, I suppose, um, it gives people the opportunity to just sit and listen to somebody on their own with no judgment. That's what I, that's what I think is like, what I love about it is that they can just sit there and hear someone else tell their story and think to themselves, if it's okay for that person to tell their story, maybe it'll be okay for me to tell mine. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, I don't know that people, obviously we get so many messages and people will just tell us, they might just tell us in a private message, which I'm sure you get a lot too. Yeah. A lot. But even, even just hearing it, even just knowing that they had that five minutes to sit down and write a message, uh, a, you know, a DM, like, I don't know, I like keep saying the same thing, but I just feel really honored that someone yeah. would even take the time out to do that. So yeah. yeah, that they look to you as a as a person who can hear it, which is yeah. an honor. Um, and this room, so somebody just sent in a, a comment here. So what if the person you're talking to appreciates the desire for connection, and it feels good to hear somebody else talk? For example, um, a friend miscarried, and I've had a stillborn and a miscarriage, and that feels like a good way for us to connect. So what about those folks who um, like that power of connection that mm -hmm. when you hear somebody who had a loss similar to yours and you get to connect on that. So what do you think about um, yeah, the, I mean, the me too with that aspect from that angle? Well, I think, I don't think we could eat. I mean, those are like the most cherished relationships there are when you have, you know, if you have someone and you guys can meet somewhere there's there's that, that connection part mm -hmm. where they go oh my, everything you're saying i get and yeah. and vice versa i mean that's like i i initially in my very early stages after so my dad died first and then my mom died i was like i do not know a single other person on this mm -hmm. planet um except for one friend who had recently quite recently also experienced the same thing and her and i just like magnets like we just yeah. And everything was basic. Everything came out of each other's mouths. We're yeah. like, yes. Yeah. You know, and so there's um, really powerful there about kinship. Yeah. So, so I think, yeah. of course, I think like, look, you know, I know for me, and I'm only speaking for me, like I was quite prickly in those days, those early days. I felt like nobody could like say anything. Yeah. Right to me. I, I, I was so broken and hurt. Mm -hmm. And I, and I was missing the, I felt like the only people in the world that could like make it right. We're just not here anymore. And um, so, so I probably took a lot of things up like <laughs> wrong, but I learned a lot about myself in the process, but certainly those moments I know. Um, and I know this from other friends who have experienced similar losses. So whether it be like um, an episode we just did, which was really like so powerful about some a group of men in Ireland who are they're scheduled to play this football match in May. I really hope they get to play it. Mm. Um, and it's all in honor of the the babies, the babies that they lost. And uh, they're going to wear the baby's names oh. on the back of their jerseys. And these guys are all connected through neonatal, like prenatal or um, stillbirth and neonatal loss. So babies that died, you know, quite early on. And they get together and they talk in on that on the episode which was not this week week before mm -hmm. um they just talk about what it feels like to be in that room with other guys who know what it's like to lose a baby mm. and it's like remarkable you could just feel the energy between yeah. them because they'd been through something similar together and they allowed each other completely allowed each other to tell each other sto you know, to talk to hear each other's stories so there's a huge power in when you do feel like someone is saying something and it's speaking directly to you. Yeah. And it, for me, I think the, the thing that makes um, the yes, me too different is, um, is the power of choice. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to my, my awesome neighbor with the dog fight, if I had said um, that sounds really difficult, I, I had a similar experience um, with somebody who was in my care and I, I didn't set it up for success for them. And, mm. and I'm happy to share my experience with you if it would feel helpful. Um, yeah. You know, right. So we're, we're giving the, the first speaker the option 
you know, if you like, oh man, I would, I really don't know how to deal with this. And I would really, I feel really alone in it. And I would really love to hear what it's like for you. Yeah. Then yes, have at it, right? Like there's yeah. so much power in the, the overlapping Venn diagram of loss um, that makes all of this survivable and bearable. And if you don't want to hear about somebody else's loss in this moment, because you're feeling prickly or your bandwidth mm. is just not there, then you should have the option to say like, um, I'm sorry that happened to you. I, I can't actually listen to that story right now. So I, it's really important that I stick with my own for the moment. Mm. Uh, somebody else had made a comment in here sort of along those lines that they had mentioned that their mom um, was uh, going through cancer treatments and somebody they didn't really know started crying because they had just either lost somebody to cancer yeah. or somebody. Um, sorry, I, I didn't quote that exactly because the comments went away, but I didn't um, to go up so fast. But I mean, all of this, all of this is tricky and all of this is messy. And you know, that the person who falls apart when they hear your own devastating news, um, that's not always nefarious and that's not always a bad no. skill. Sometimes it's like, you know, I mean, it reminds me of like, have you ever had this experience, Sasha, where like, uh, you can deal with people being sort of prickly and jerks, but the moment that somebody is incredibly kind to you, you completely lose your shit. Like, yeah. Down, oh, yeah. Right. And so like, in the presence of somebody else's pain, sometimes that's all it takes for a person to just completely dissolve because it's like, mm. okay, I don't know what room of hell you're in, but I can see that you're in hell. <laughs> Thank God. Like, there's a... Oh, yeah. a there's a there's a prompt in the writing course about the Medusas taking off their hats and like mm. where all the snakes get to be free and what power it is to just like be in a room where everybody is prickly and yep. covered in snakes <laughs> and like I, I like that's, that's such a great metaphor be, yeah yeah like your pain doesn't have to be um covered up and people don't need to be protected from it you know which is sometimes how we feel in the outside world and I know like the energy oh my god the energy hiding it oh my god yeah was so hard yeah the energy of just trying to be something different than what I really was was just exhausting on a level that I couldn't keep up I do think what you said though I think one thing you said it earlier on and I think it relates really well to this is you can go back yeah. like, so like if you it's like if you don't over. if you don't do it right I, I think years later, I think it's actually yeah. really an incredible thing to do is go back years later and say to someone, I fucked that up. Yep. Like I, I said the wrong things and I wasn't there and I want to see if we can try again. To And I think people are really, I, I my experience some of the, some of the time, not all the time, people are like, are really open, can be really open to that when the thing, the dust has settled a little bit and they're like, oh, wow, and they can appreciate the apology and the recognition of the fact that it wasn't dealt with 100%. It's not It's not just because you didn't deal with it right once doesn't make it yeah, the forever right. decision. Yeah, that's not for keepsies, right? Like, yeah, you do get exactly. to have yours. And, like, that's that process of making amends, right? We can borrow mm -hmm. that from the recovery community where um, I recognize that um, these were the things that I did and they that wasn't my intention, but they landed that way. And here's how I take responsibility. And here's what I'd like to do moving forward. Mm -hmm. Right? Like these are these are uh, truth and reconciliation conversations, um, yeah. which I always go back and, and like look at as this incredible example of um, how we how we acknowledge damage. Right? Mm -hmm. You can't go back and undo damage, but you can acknowledge it. And that makes it different, right? Like, I think that mm. can really heal some relationships if you can come back and say, wow, I have learned a lot since, since then. And yeah. looking back, I'm sort of horrified at the ways that I showed up for you. And they, um, they weren't right. And I'm sorry. And here's what I know. And here's what I'm going to do differently moving forward. Do you have any questions of me? Um, exactly. And I think it takes bravery. And that bravery makes, like, the bravery to, like, face yourself. Yes. Like, that's, I mean, that's what this pandemic, we, I know we said we were going to talk about this pandemic the whole time. We haven't talked about it that much at all. But mm -hmm. this, this, <laughs> the thing I'm finding in this is I feel like it's like kind of challenging me to be a bit braver with my mm -hmm. self. So I'm kind of like, it's like asking you to step up a little bit in the sense that you're, I don't, that there's, there's a lot of distraction that's been taken yeah. out of the equation. <laughs> Can you give me an example of what you're talking about? Yes, I can. Uh, <laughs> well, but you I'm just said to you're being braver. I want you to tell me how. 
I'm going to give you an example. It's very, and, I, and I'm putting myself out there. So I'm going to okay. do it. Um, so I was in bed watching American Beauty. It's on Netflix now. <laughs> and That's one the, it was, my husband was downstairs. I was upstairs. He'd gone for a run. And then I was getting towards the end of the movie. I won't give away the end of the movie, although I'm sure most people have seen it. But the the main character is talking about his daughter as she is a, a, almost an adult. And then he remembers her as she is a little girl. And it's just this like very moving yeah. piece of the movie. And I just immediately press pause and like bawled crying because I had felt like I was on my phone too much around my daughter. Mm. And I, right, for some reason it made me think these moments are precious and someday she's going to be a teenager and she's going to be an adult. And am I scrolling while these moments are happening? Or am I really as present as I should be? Sorry, it's, it's actually very hard to talk about. Yeah, it's yeah. gross. Yeah. And I was like, I have to deal with this. I got to cut down on this. I got to I gotta face it that, you know, we're, I know it's not just me. I know it is a global uh-huh. phenomenon that we're all doing this. But I was kind of like, if I can cut back a little bit more and be more present and really, really feel these moments more and I don't think I would have recognized that a couple of weeks ago Mm. I think I was living in a little bit of a fog Mm. where that was concerned yeah and it was tough and yucky and I still feel yucky talking about it now because it's kind of like you know you have to hold yourself up to the light and say I've got to be better than I'm being Mm. um so yeah that in that way I feel like it's kind of like there's no place to hide with some stuff like I can't I don't know. There's just so much distraction in day-to-day life. And now there's a little bit of this like quiet, which yes. is also really hard for everybody. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But for me, that was one of, that's the example that came to mind where I was like, I, I felt like it was a good thing, a really scary, horrible thing that made me cry a lot, but a good thing to recognize. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that <laughs> with, not only with me, but with everybody, yeah. right? because that, that is bravery to hold your gaze on yourself, mm. right? And to be able to look at that and be like, oof, yeah. I'm sure me is going to regret something that present me is doing. And and um, there is, there's something in there about, um, oh gosh, I just had it in my head and it was so beautiful. Come on back into my brain. <laughs> but something about like their, um, like we kind of get squicked out by those intense mm. health realizations and I also like underneath that is a real desire to show up for your life and to um to honor the relationship and the the transient nature of life and the fleeting nature of life and that that's a love impulse mm. right like as painful and messy and uncomfortable as that is to see it it's like what is the impulse underneath that the impulse underneath that is I want to be here in this love I have for my daughter. So what are some ways that I can be present in that? Because what I just saw was uncomfortable and not in line with what I want. And like, it also reminded me of um, one of the, one of the Aramaic, Aramaic translations of the, or one of the translations of the Aramaic word that we get as sin that was really badly described. A different translation of the word sin is to miss the mark. Right. Which I really, really love instead of it being like this weird cosmic pass fail, you, you fuck up, you're doomed. But um, instead it reframes it as what we were talking about earlier. Like we're aiming towards this one thing mm-hmm. and sometimes we miss the mark. And if we miss the mark on something important, then maybe we want to recalibrate. Yeah. Maybe we want to look at um, how can I set things up a little bit better? How can I structure things for myself that I am more likely to, to meet my aim like to hit the mark that I want so that I don't fall away from it and and that shit's uncomfortable it's that well that's exactly what I was was just gonna say like it's and I've I feel like a lot of the stuff that you talk about has helped me come to that and and a lot of the kind of like reading I've done ever since my mom died is about the yucky stuff the denial and trying to like like it's very easy to tell yourself things that make you 
make peace with things, right? Like, so I'm going to make peace with how I'm acting or I'm going to make peace with my decisions because it's just too yucky and it just hurts too much to go any other direction with this. Um, but now, and especially with what's going on right now, I feel like not to say, I'm not, I'm, I was going to say opportunity. I, I don't know what I mean. We're, we have no, it's no, we have no choice. We're in this. Right, right, right. <laughs> like, it's not about an opportunity. It's just about the, the reality that there's this time and lots of time. Lots of time. And I would rather use some of it to invest in some of the real stuff mm -hmm. in my brain and my heart if I can, mm -hmm. where I can, without overwhelming myself, but also just finding a way to go. There's some shit you got to deal with and, you know, it's, it's well, here. I like, I like that the shit you're dealing with is in the service of more love and connection, right? Yeah, it's not, I mean, yeah. you know, I, I got to stop online shopping or something. Like, <laughs> I got to stop doing these things that are um, uh, not building a relationship in the way that I want to. Like, I guess I'm just like, I'm such a big advocate for like, let's reframe that as, as um, love, even though it feels yucky, <laughs> right? And, and I think this is one of the things that is happening during this pandemic is that um, people are connecting more or wanting to connect more because suddenly our, our distractions and distractions are not bad. Distractions are also routine. Like we're busy. Yeah. Um, so it's not a, a bad thing, but without those distractions, without those daily routines, we're suddenly like, oh, wow, connections are really important. Yeah. Connections are the only thing we have, right? Like all of this other external stuff can go away, but connection is our survival. So where do my relationships need tending? Where do my relationships need work? And, um, you know, grief throws a monkey wrench into all of that stuff anyway. Mm. So, and then we've got you also in that sort of liminal time of being pregnant. Yes. Um, all you this. can't you I can't know. see that right now, but can't I'm see very that, but pregnant. We know there. She's uh, very and pregnant. You also had that you had that article come out in the uh, Statesman in the UK uh, today. So I I linked in that. We'll link it again when we put this this up in stories. But that whole like this all stitches in together like this really intense time where sort of the outer trappings of daily life are not available at this time. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of new stressors and connection is really important and it and it's sort of like this is what we've been talking about in the grief community for such a long time is like the importance to connect the importance mm -hmm. to tell the truth about your own experience and how that builds relationships um and now it's like well the rest of the world is starting to come into the party a little bit and you know they're like oh my gosh relationships are important and empathy and connection and we're like <laughs> yeah we got you we're, we're on this i know I know, and I, I have really, I have really been like, I, I won't say laughing, but like laughing a little bit, watching some of the stuff you're talking about because I'm like, oh my god, it's crazy how, you know, I'm gonna say it. Suddenly, collectively, people are like, I don't want my parents to die, and I'm like, no shit, you don't want your parents to die, like that would be, that would really suck, huh? Like it's yeah, awful. Not <laughs> yeah, we're not sad, and, and you'd be sad, right? So like when I was sad. It was, it was actually okay. Right? You get that now? Yeah. Exactly. And people are like, I don't, I'm afraid my loved ones are going to die. I'm afraid my partner is going to die. I'm afraid that my child might get this. I'm afraid. And you're sitting there thinking, well, yeah. And, and I'm, it's nice to see the world open up to empathy and open up to these ideas and think we're, I, I think the, the word is definitely vulnerability. There's this like collective yes. vulnerability that just wasn't there. I feel like to me, well, this is just my feeling of how I would interpret it. The world felt like a lot of bravado, mm. you yeah. know, and, and now it's like, it's not, no, no one's getting away with that. There's no bravado here. Yeah. And I think uh, that bravado is like, that's a protective mechanism, right? Yeah. It's also one of the reasons that we avoid talking about grief and try to cheer other people up is because we don't want to understand how soft and vulnerable this body is and the bodies of the people we love. Yeah. I mean, that's, and that's like, I only, vulnerability, um, my friend Courtney, who I don't know if she's watching this, but um, Hi, I'll give her a shout <laughs> Hi, Courtney, I'll give her a shout out. Um, she opened, she like really opened my eyes about vulnerability. It was something I had never really, I always like saw it as like something to like hide or, you know, like, like don't open it up. Don't, you know, don't, don't show I'm it to there. people. Yeah. But now, 
I'm like really into learning about it. And one of the big things is at work. I've been reading about like the power. I, I manage a team, a digital creative team, and like just being vulnerable with them, just telling them how I feel uh, and being okay to say, hey, I'm, this is really scary. Are you scared? I'm scared. Mm. You know, um, or saying things like, oh, you know, my husband and I had a fight last night and it sucked. Um, and, and having people go, oh, oh, that gives them the kind of, that they can be vulnerable too. Yes. Um, my husband and I didn't have a fight last night. I know he's probably downstairs watching this going like, what fight are you talking about? <laughs> I thought that you were talking about a coworker <laughs> who was sharing that story. So <laughs> that's okay. They, they, maybe they had a fight last night. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> we were talking about a hypothetical person. Is what we were doing. <laughs> but, um, the vulnerability, the collective vulnerability, feeling everyone being vulnerable, it's oh, it's, it's overwhelming. Yes, actually. Well, there's a reason um, that we avoid that, right? Because it can be overwhelming, and and trying to avoid that vulnerability and the 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 feelings that come up when you start tapping that, like that's why we try to talk other people out of their grief or or bypassing mm. them. And I think you're right. Like we don't we don't have that luxury right now. Mm. Um, the general population, there's too much uh, mortality right in your face, mm. right? And I think that's also doing this thing where, like, people are having this reaction where they don't want to know anything about it as well, because it's so scary. Sure. And that's like, that's human nature, too. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, at, going back to like, scrolling on your phone, or like, checking out with mm -hmm. all of the different iterations of Star Trek, because that's the only <laughs> thing you can handle. Um, that's not bad. Yeah. Right. I think we also have this idea that distractions are a bad thing. And like, you have to be able to check out sometimes. Like I have a really big capacity to listen to pain from other people, mm. but it is not limitless. And yeah. if I don't go check out and watch Star Trek, uh, which yeah. has a lot of grief themes, by the way, friends, oh. spoilers, geez. Uh, that. But y you have to, you have to be able to step back and to avert your eyes sometimes. Uh, otherwise you yeah. can't stay here. Right. you can't stay here and you also lose your you, you're depleted and you're not as good as you could be and right. um i think that's like to be your best self there has to be something that like last night my friends and i we did a zoom party for a birthday yeah. and just we just laugh honestly like i'm so pregnant they all had drinks i didn't obviously <laughs> and like they were drunk and i i'm just i'm so pregnant <laughs> I'm just so pregnant like I was just like I was actually taking they were drinking beer and I was drinking indigestion medication <laughs> like I was like <laughs> I was like downing it out of the bottle and we but we laughed man we laughed so much about the stupidest stuff mm -hmm. and it it was the release and the catharsis that just needed to happen like I just needed to get on with these exact people yeah. and have a laugh and talk about really dumb stuff and it you know without those things and without those you know without I mean that's where technology is becoming a really like I'm so fascinated as to how what our relationship is going to be like with it at the end of this yeah like will it be our yeah, savior that, or will it be our you know connection, the connections that we're finding through the safety of the screen and yeah. how do they translate back out into the physical world of touch I don't know it's going to be we get to lead with curiosity on that one that's totally that's awesome. Um, so we've got about six minutes before we're going to wrap up. So I just want to give us that marker. And friends, the reason we do that is because when I did uh, an Instagram live on Monday, I didn't realize that uh, Instagram shuts it down at an yes, hour. It does. And they shut it down automatically and you don't get a chance to save it. So I'm trying to be really mindful of time this time. Um, so knowing that we have about six minutes and we, you know, we sort of touched on all of the things that we wanted to touch on and, and we sort of naturally came back to community and community of grieving people and why having spaces to be able to tell the truth about your own experience is important. And, and even being able to be in a place where you can laugh with fellow grieving people, it's like you can giggle from your, you know, down the hallway in the rooms of hell. And um, what do you, what do you want to wrap us up with thinking about um, grief and community and, and making spaces for each other? To, to I just think, um, I think we right now, like we we're just talking there a little bit. We have like this. This feels like a time where we can, we have a little bit of space to talk to each other some more. 
um, and not to kind of to I think it would be a good time for like to to talk about our I, I personally feel like talking about my own grief feels a little bit scary right now like mm-hmm. with everything that's going on but um, it's still so important and I hope it doesn't get sidetracked and people don't feel like they can't talk about their stories yeah um, I hope you, people still know that there's places where these stories are being told and we're listening and that it's just because there's a global pandemic doesn't mean that the person that you lost three months ago suddenly gets overshadowed by that. That's yeah. so far from the truth. Yeah. Um, and that people, I mean, it's, grief is a very lonely experience anyway. Anyway, in the best of times. In the best of times, reaching out can feel like an abyss. So when you can't actually see your friends and you can't go to a movie or you can't do these things that help, it can be even harder. So I just hope that the, these pockets of community, these places that we have tried to make um, are places that people feel they can be open and, and talk and feel supported. Um, even if it's just with a couple of love hearts and a, mm-hmm. and a, I'm with you and I hear you um, message because there are other people out there who are in the, same boat um who are listening yeah yeah there are more of us out here than you would think yeah and especially you know even the best of supporters in your personal circles right now sometimes because of this pandemic their bandwidth has evaporated um they've got their own emotional and family triage going on and and even if they wanted to be there for you they just don't have the capacity and that doesn't mean your need goes away Right. And finding these spaces, leaning into these spaces, um, you know, stuff like uh, Sasha's podcast and our online communities, even the comments section here. I've been watching people connect in the comments on on live here and um, linking up and buddying up everybody. Right. Mm. I think even like, look look, look at you and me, like, you know, we we connected through it. And like now I feel like we have like a genuine, we're pals and it feels great. We are. And hopefully... So I know. I, I know, right? Like, you know where I'm going? I know where you're going. I have a giant family trip planned to Ireland for October of this year. It was a surprise for my it's parents happening. for Christmas. It is fucking happening. It's happening. I don't know if it's, it's happening, happening this October, but it is happening. It's happening. We're yeah. making this happen. We're making it happen. That's right. We we need my parents to get to Ireland before they die, friends. So yes. wash your hands, shelter at home. Yes. Stay home. Don't be on shit. Like... <laughs> We have plans. We need, we need to get Megan to Ireland ASAP. We need, to, we need to get my parents to Ireland so that I can fulfill their lifelong dreams before somebody gets sick and dies. So yes, it is all about me right Play now. by the rules. All right, I'm going to wrap this up so that Instagram doesn't Thank you. cut us off. So just to recap right now, I'm going to hit end and it's going to let me save, right, Sasha? Yeah, do it. Do it yeah. now. Thanks, everybody, I'm gonna for watching. do it. All right, everybody. Nice I to will, see you. Uh, I will... I will post the video of this up, everybody. And if for some reason the tech fails, which it won't, um, we'll do what we did last time, which is do a screen recording of the stories. Anyway, thank you, darling Sasha. Uh, thank you so much. We'll talk soon. Your people for me. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye, friends. Bye, bye.